Hello and welcome to the programme. My guest today is a British botanist who did her PhD on the genetics of tomatoes in the Galapagos Islands, those islands in the Pacific Ocean made famous, of course, by Charles Darwin in his book On the Origin of Species. Sarah Fogel also won a competition a few years ago talking to plants, indeed to tomatoes. Hers grew more than any others at the sound of her voice. I wonder if it has something to do with her genes because her maiden name is Darwin. I should introduce you properly as Sarah Darwin. Um, thanks for coming on the show. Um, yes, Charles Darwin was your great, great... great, great. Three greats? Two greats. Two greats. Great, great grandfather. And is that how you became interested in, 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 in plants and uh, biology and... Well, I was always, always interested in plants. As a child, other children had guinea pigs and goldfish. And I had... Um, I grew plants. In fact, I had uh, two avocado plants. One was called avo and the other one was called cardo. Um, and at a young age, I put them in the window and watched them grow and I measured them on a weekly basis and I had a little chart where I wrote down the heights of these plants and, and at a young age saw plants and, and realised that actually, although they were the same species, they actually looked quite different. So Did your avocados thing. grow? Because I did the same thing and mine were very spindly. Yes, well, they, but... need, they need lots of sunlight. Yeah, I mean, they are tropical plants, so... Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you said in another interview, if I may say, that Charles Darwin was the father of biology. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, biology was around before him, I believe. Absolutely. What you, so what did you mean by that? Well, I think um, modern... One of the foundations of modern biology is actually the theory of evolution. And although Darwin didn't come up with the theory of evolution, he came up with the mechanism of speciation. So it, it forms the foundation. Mm. Uh, so it combines natural history, paleontology, um, uh, various different disciplines that Darwin brought together. Um, and as I say, it forms the very, very basics mm. of biology. I mean, at the time, in the 19th century, his theories were quite a shock, really, you know, that, that we're descended from the apes. I mean... Um, a common ancestor with apes. Yeah, yes, OK. Absolutely. They were amazing discoveries made then. But yeah. Today, are we just going on the details or do you think there are eureka moments still happening? Oh, I think there are definitely eureka moments yeah? happening. Yeah, absolutely. Like? Yeah. Um, well, I think, <laughs> I think uh, probably for our generation, maybe finding life in uh, another universe, that would be pretty exciting. You know, this, this I'm sure will happen. I'm sure. It won't necessarily look as we might expect it, but I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. yeah. Interesting one. Do you think we're more connected with nature today than we were in the time of Darwin? No. Well, no, I don't, in fact. I think when you consider uh, our, the average... the amount of time we spend in nature now, even our generation, uh, compared to our children's generation, we spent double the amount of time in nature. So, in fact, I think we're less connected and in a slightly peculiar way, although Darwin was... who basically said that, um, that humans share a, a common origin with all species. You know, he was one of the first people to say, actually, all animals and plants share one single common origin. Mm. Mm. And in spite of that, I think we still have this idea that in some way we're, we're sort of a step apart from nature. Um, and the, this generation spend less and less time in, in wild spaces than we did. Um, and I see this pattern continuing unless we make a, a really, really active case for getting people back into nature. Rather sad sort of... Ooh. Doesn't sound very good. Let, let's see you in nature yes. in the Galapagos Islands. Here is where he you are at night time, obviously. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 with the Galapagos tomato plant. What's Absolutely. the fascination with that? What, well, so, I mean, you did a PhD on that. I did, I did. And actually, I, it was quite amazing. I spent nine years studying these tomatoes and I never got bored. Uh, and I probably could have continued studying them. I mean, it's endlessly fascinating. So. Um, there are only uh, two species of tomatoes in the world that are edible, and uh, both of them are found in the Galapagos Islands as introduced plants. 
And on top of that, in the Galapagos Islands, you also have two endemic species that are found nowhere else in the world. Oh, wow. Um, except for, you know, in greenhouses. And they're not edible? Um, well, you can eat them, but they are disgusting. Um, as I always say, you wouldn't want to make a Bloody Mary out of a Galapagos tomato. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> now, uh, continuing with tomatoes, I said in the intro, you won a competition. Well, I don't know whether it was really a competition, but talking to plants. And, I mean, tell us about that, because you talked to... You had some tomato plants and you were asked to... It was the Royal Horticultural Society. I, I have to add here that it was... This was done on the 1st of April. So there was a, a humorous aspect to this. And, and basically, they had a, a national call for people to come to the Royal Horticultural Society and uh, read and get read a piece of text and have it recorded. And then the idea was that each little tomato would wear a set of headphones um, and would have, <laughs> have individuals reading sections of, of text to see which voice um, made the plant oh, grow I see. quicker. You should explain April the first. It was. It was. Broadcasting around the world is called April Fool's April Day, where Fool's we Day, come from. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, in Europe, oh, I see. No, but um, you were actually reading, weren't you? Reading yes. from the origin of, of well, species. Two thousand and nine was the anniversary of uh, Darwin's birth, two hundredth anniversary of his birth, and so I thought that it would be very apt to read, as I said, the cover, cover to cover of On the Origin of Species, and it's, it's so I read the first paragraph and the last paragraph and my tomato plant um, seemed to grow more than the others. But if and I, I believe women did better than men. Apparently so. <laughs> I think this is a little bit of pseudoscience. No. Uh, you know, in order to do experiments like that, you would have to have many, many repeats. I only had one tomato. So who knows, my tomato may have been bigger to start with. But sort of jokes aside, do you think that plants do have feelings? I think plants can certainly sense a lot, but I don't think they have emotions, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, I, they, can, they can tell the time, uh, they can sense when other plants are in the vicinity, they can communicate uh, if there are predators eating them, they can communicate this information to other plants. Um, so they, they do an awful lot of very, very clever stuff, but they don't have brains. Um, and I don't believe they have um, emotions. Um, but OK. They... Let's find out more about this. There's been quite a lot of research done on this subject in recent years, and here's one example from here in Germany. <music> Do you think it's um, always going to be a mystery? Or you say that... I think he rather agrees with you. I mean... No emotions, no brain, but feelings. Do you think we'll find out lots, lots more? Oh, I'm sure we will, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, and it's, it's very exciting uh, research. I mean, I wanted to ask you about other advancements in science, ones that you may or may not approve of. I mean, are they all good? I, I'm thinking particularly of GM crops, which is a big subject at the moment, or has been for some years. Yeah. I was amazed to read... Um, at the weekend, I didn't realise that 80% of uh, genetically modified corn... Maize, yes. Uh, 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 sorry, 80% of corn in America mm. is GM. Yeah. Not here. We're quite strict in the European we Union, are. aren't we? Yeah. Should it remain that way? I mean, what do you think? Well, I think there are two, there are two issues with GM. One is um, what will it do to the environment? So if you have genetically modified maize, corn growing in a field next to wild growing plants, then you can get the GM pollen into your native populations. The same thing would be with the Galapagos tomatoes, for example. You, you get gene transfer, so um, the pollen from one plant can be fertilised on another plant, and then you can have this sort of hybrid seed. So the effect in the environment is one thing, and then the effect on human health is another, and I think, you know, great caution is required when, when doing this research. I mean, to play a devil's advocate, we've got to feed the world, though, yeah. haven't we? Well, I think we don't have a shortage of food. What we have is a transport issue. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of food, grain, is actually gr grown to feed animals that we eat. And if we were all a little bit more controlled and less 
ate a little bit less meat, um, then there would certainly be enough food for everyone. Mm, great. Um, let's go back to your childhood and, and start with a, a very cute picture, actually, which you sent us. We, yes. I love getting pictures from our guests. So. And is this the time, <laughs> here you are, as a young girl, is this the time of Avo and Cardo? Yes, it is yeah, exactly. Yeah. And actually, just before that, tears had been rolling down my eyes because I had to wear I had to wear shoes, and we were so lucky in our childhood we didn't have to wear shoes. And I'm squeezed into these shoes that are far too small for me. <laughs> um, where was this? Because I have forgotten to mention you were born in London and brought yes, up there um, and in Hampshire. In, in, uh, I a... went to school in Hampshire, and my that was at my grandmother's house. She had a, a place in Essex, and oh. uh, we were lucky enough to be able to spend a lot of our summers just by the sea. And so it's very much, a, yeah, the yeah. countryside. Yes, and this yes. is, this, I, I also like this because <laughs> I have to admit that I had a, like your two brothers here, I had a haircut like that too. Yes. And I think I most probably wore clothes like that and as well. If that was in colour, you'd see that they're wearing lurid ties. It was a real 1970s. Yeah. Kipper ties, probably, <laughs> yeah. Is that, that, that actually... Yeah, it's a shame we haven't got that in colour, actually, because I can remember those yeah, too. Yeah. I still have a couple of them at home. This leads me quite well on to... Um, you did have a job as a freelance decorative designer. Yes. Do tell me what that is. Yeah, I know. That was the most... Was it Kipper ties? No, well, yeah. it, I guess it probably could. In fact, I did make ties. Uh, yes, I did. I screen-printed very lurid 1980s ties. Um, but it was uh, decorative design is basically, um, for example, we have a, a wooden panel here behind us um, and uh, I was painting sort of bits of wood to look like different types of wood, um, if you like. It's a bit difficult to tell. So I did things like trompe l'oeil, where you um, try and deceive the eye, so you paint a, a view through a window on a flat wall. Um, and then you had a business um, in a specialist picture framing. This was in London, presumably. Yes, yes. Yeah. and uh, we specialised in framing for artists and galleries. Um, and again, I used my uh, sort of paint finishes, if you like, to do these sort of one-off frames for people. So you came to botany sort of later on. Yeah. Really. And then did that... I, I read um, that then, then you went to Australia and went to live in a, a rainforest. Yes. Now, that sounds quite yeah. drastic. It was. It was very, yeah. very I mean, drastic. Why From did you a, do that? Yeah, it was, um, it was a really interesting experience. Um, I, I found myself living in a rainforest, really. I'd, I'd gone to Queensland for a, a couple of days. I was living in Sydney at the time, and I travelled up to Queensland for a, f a few weeks. Um, and uh, I was staying in a youth hostel, and uh, there was a storm one night, and uh, the, uh, the local farmer came rushing down to the youth hostel and said, we've, we've got a, a crisis, a lot of our banana plants have been knocked over in the storm. And is there anybody here who could come and help work? And I thought, oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. I haven't done that before. So I went to work on this farm packing bananas and uh, moved into a, a little, actually a garage in the rainforest uh, without electricity or running water or uh, anything, actually. It was basically a floor and walls and a ceiling. Um, and, uh, yeah, I had a very interesting time, I think, just sort of getting a little bit back, searching out a little bit more into... Yeah, you were eventually going to get there, Yeah, you? I was, yeah. yes. So and is this when you started uh, that illustrating That was when I started, your, I started with bananas. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, literally. <laughs> <laughs> because and we do have... Uh, Sarah has brought in with... With, with her, two wonderful, um, if I may say, two wonderful illustrations, which um, I have with me here. And uh, actually, there at the top, if we can, I don't know whether we can get close up on this one, um, is the Galapagos tomato plant, is it not? And actually, as they're zooming in, do tell us what, what's next to it. OK, Some of the things. an orchid to the right. Uh -huh. um, an endemic orchid, so only found in the Galapagos Islands, and a uh, giant sunflower tree to the left. Um, these are these wonderful endemic 
uh, flowers again from the Galapagos Islands. And uh, going, similar... going, oh, it's got, we've gone. It's gone there. No, anyway, Sarah has very generously donated this signed print of hers to give away here on the show. It's signed by Sarah Darwin herself. If you'd like to go into the draw for this, please write to us at insight at dw.de. You can also write and tell us your solutions for planet Earth, if you like. Why not? You don't have to, but we'd be interested to hear your opinions from around the world as we broadcast all over the world. I think, it's be, so you know, see what people say. Yeah, that's a nice They're idea. absolutely beautiful, and I'm very envious because I can't draw to save Ah, oh, but you can sing, you see. I'd love to be able to sing. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I want to move on because you took part in a reenactment of uh, the famous voyage of the Beagle. Charles Darwin, well, not his boat, but the famous voyage. Now, this was just a few years ago. Do yep. tell us about that. And I, I should, at the same time, find the picture because they really did do it on yes. a grand yeah. scale. Uh, we were not slumming it, I can assure no. you. That was the most comfortable ship. It was nothing like the voyage of Beagle, really, because we had showers and freezers and fresh food and You're it was not meant to tell me yeah, this. I know, but it was it was absolutely it was really real luxury. Yeah. It was real luxury. But we so it was uh, the anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth and the anniversary of On the Origin of Species, which was his mighty tome yeah. that changed the world. And what was the purpose? The of purpose the trip was to then? have a look at the future of species. So we travelled around the world in the order that uh, Darwin travelled. We visited many of the places that he went to. Um, and we did 35 uh, different documentaries um, mm -hmm. around the world. Really? And this was for Dutch television? This was for Dutch, yeah. VPRO, yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's available yeah. online if anybody wants to have a look at it. <laughs> OK. And here, here you are with one of your children, I yes, think. Yes, that's my son, Joss. That was, uh, I think that was Christmas Day, actually. Yeah. We're all dressed up for and, Christmas and Day on board. your husband, who I, I have to comment on the amazing moustache that he has. Now, does he, does he, is there a lot of work that goes a into that? A lot of work, but really? I'm afraid I'm not going to tell you anything more about it. It's family secrets. Oh, OK. Yeah. But needless to say, he spends more time in the bathroom... Much more than, time than in the bathroom anybody else. than I do. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and we should just, you see, that's one of your boys, and here, here you are. Oops, no, that's the wrong one with the other one, yes, again, that's, on board. that's on the bow of, of the Stad Amsterdam. And, and did, I mean, did they, they must have had an extraordinary time. Yeah, they did. That, that, that son, Leo, was six at the time, and, and yeah. he, he uh, always makes friends with purveyors of food, so the chef was his number one sort yeah. of uh, fan. And, uh, and he helped in the kitchen and helped, uh, helped serving food and cleaning tables and, <laughs> and uh, actually... Uh, steering the boat. Um, I mean, it was a, a unique experience for them. I mean, there was obviously a serious side to this voyage as well. As you said, there was lots of um, uh, scientific research done. I mean, was there also um, uh, stuff about climate change? Was there any... Yeah. I mean, were you investigating yes, that we, too? we were. Well, we, were, we had scientists on board who did various experiments uh, all the way around the world. Um, and in addition to that, we were doing somewhere between a sort of a documentary and a news piece. So, for example, in Brazil, we went to look at the tropical forest that Darwin um, had experienced. Um, and It's still there? Well, unfortunately not. Um, not the Atlantic forest. A lot of the uh, Brazilian uh, Amazon, of course, is still there. But we were in this uh, Atlantic forest and a lot of that has gone. And, and so Darwin arrived in the Amazon in, in the uh, Atlantic forest. And I think he was, you know, it was one of the most exciting uh, feelings for him and one that stayed with him for the mm. rest of his life, this sort of emotion of being in nature, um, surrounded by this sort of intense mm. nature. And you also, of course, went to the Galapagos, yeah. which you'd been to before, yes. as we know. But that, yeah. was that very special, um, very arriving special. on this boat and...? We arrived, that, that photograph was yeah. uh, when yeah. we were in the Pacific. Yeah. Sailing to the Galapagos, um, they loom out of the mist. It, you know, they, they really are. It was the most amazing experience. Did you sort of feel a closeness to I your great-great-grandfather yeah. in, yeah, in I any think, way? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a... 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do and I did. Yeah, I mean, I think the more I read about him, the more amazing I think he was. Um, and having spent, you know, quite long periods of time on board a ship, uh, where, you know, I have to say, there were, we had our fair share of excitement, um, you know, people not getting on, you know. I, oh, I know. As you can imagine, with TV uh, on ships, certainly, certainly the crew were wonderful, but the, you know we had our fair share of arguments, <laughs> alpha males, let's say, and possibly alpha females as well. Um, and uh, you know, it really brought home to me what an amazing he must have had the most fantastic people skills. To... Yeah, because of course your trip was eight months, his trip was three, or was five it five? Years. Five years. Five years. Anyway. Let's go to the Galapagos Islands now, which is a very special place for my guest and home to some very special species as well. These scientists with the Charles Darwin Foundation have spent the last 12 hours on a ship. Now they're off to look for penguins on the Galapagos Island of Isabella. The islands are home to the only penguins found in the Northern Hemisphere as well as the green ocean turtle, which is facing extinction. The biodiversity on these volcanic islands is unique, but climate change is taking its toll. Many species are finding their food sources in short supply, and that's affecting reproduction. The last time these scientists visited, they marked nests to facilitate counting the local penguin population. They estimate that it's barely a thousand. One of the biggest threats is the El Nino climate pattern. It causes extreme weather and rising temperatures. The giant tortoise is also endemic to the Galapagos Islands. They can live to be 170 years old. The Galapagos tortoise limbs off grass, herbs, and cactus. But if it can't find enough food, it stops reproducing. Things aren't yet that bad. The Charles Darwin Foundation is working in collaboration with the National Park Galapagos to set up more breeding stations. Ecuador is making the preservation of this unique ecosystem a priority. The tortoises are released into the wild once they're five years old. We've gone from protecting individual species to protecting entire ecosystems. The most important species for the Galapagos Islands ecosystem is the tortoise. It's at the top of the food chain of herbivores here on the Galapagos Islands. It looks like a storm is brewing. The research ship is now taking the German experts to another part of the Isabella Island. Gustavo Jimenez, a veterinarian and an expert on penguins, expects they'll establish that the penguin population has declined again since the last count. The experts locate the nests they marked using GPS. Later, they'll assess their findings and discuss what protective measures they need to take to curb the trend. Time is running out. And the little Galapagos penguin could be facing extinction. My guest is Sarah Darwin, botanist, great-great-granddaughter of... Charles Darwin himself, very involved still with the Galapagos Islands, I believe, with the conservation. Yeah. Is the main problem, we saw a problem, is the main problem actually humans? Because I know that the population has increased there, the hasn't it? And there's lots of tourists. I mean, no. are, we, are we the main problem? Well, I think we are a pretty major <laughs> problem all over the world. Um, <laughs> but actually in the Galapagos, uh, they are working incredibly hard to integrate the human population within... The nature. Mm. Um, I mean, they're they're a model for many 
oceanic islands all over the world on how humans can try and live with nature. Um, so as, as you saw in that piece, there's a lot of research going on, a lot of conservation. Um, and the Galapagos Islands are actually in pretty good shape compared mm. to lots of oceanic islands. Let's, I mean, it's a good point to mix the humans with a bit of nature here. I put these two pictures you sent us together, if you don't mind, I mean, because this is your, or, or a favourite bird of yours, the blue-footed booby, um, which is just an extraordinary looking bird. And next door, of course, is your son, Joss. Yes. Um, uh, doing his best impression. He did. He was so sweet. So we, we were looking at the blue-footed booby and they have this very, very comical way of leaping around on rocks as a mating ritual yeah. and sort of passing each other very special twigs. And my son, who was, I think, around four at the time, sort of leapt onto a rock and started whistling and uh, pretending to be a blue-footed booby. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah, I'm so... wearing blue socks, oh. actually, in honour of the <laughs> blue-footed booby, if we get that. Thank you. So, um, actually, I believe I was going to say that it's your favourite bird, but you, you did tell me before the show that your favourite bird, actually, we're going to hopefully hear the sound of your favourite, oh, your yes. current favourite bird, and it has an association with Berlin, the nightingale. Tell us now, what is it? There it is, this beautiful sound of the nightingale. And what's so special about the connection with Berlin? Well, we are lucky enough in Berlin to have, uh, I think you mentioned, 3,000? Yes. Yes. Who Pairs, visit, of Who course. visit. Oh, yes, of course, they're not residents. Uh, they're, they're migrants, so they, they come here and they uh, breed here and then they fly south again. Um, and uh, we, you can hear in uh, any clear evening, or actually all t different times of day, you can hear them all over Berlin. So and why is this? Why is this peculiar well, to Berlin? I have no idea, really. I, I'm at this stage assuming it's probably because we have suitable habitats for them. Um, cats uh, tend to live indoors in Berlin rather than outside where in lots of cities, you know, they roam in and out. Um, and of course, they like this sort of protected undergrowth that we have a lot of in Berlin. I mean, lots of our parks um, in Berlin have sort of bramble, very thick bramble bushes around the base of the trees. Um, and this is, gives them a protected site. Oh, I see. So it's, it's in, in other parks in, say, London, yes. where you come from, they're too yeah. sort of cleared out, and a yeah. nightingale won't and go there. And a nightingale there. won't like that. I believe they hang around on the ground, don't Yes, they? that's yeah. right, yeah, they do. Oh, so they, they need this sort of... This protected area, yeah. OK. Yeah. Now, I, I want to ask you, talking about here, Germany, um, what do you think about the Germans and their relationship with plants and nature, then, generally? I mean, we've, we've got this wonderful visit of the nightingales yeah. um, here, but, I mean, your, your husband is the general director of the Natural History Museum here in Berlin. So, um, are there enough inquisitive Germans visiting it, for oh, instance? Yes, I, and I think, uh, I think the Germans have a very close relationship with nature and seasonality. Um, I think we celebrate in Germany the, the beginning of the Spargel season, the asparagus, and um, I'm afraid I'm one of the people who queues up for uh, quite a considerable amount of time to get strawberries in, in you know, early, early summertime. You know, and I, ha I think we have this, this link here with nature, um, much more so than I found in the UK. Really? Yeah. Really? And yet, you can get strawberries all through the year, can't yes. you? Yes. And they taste OK too. Yeah, Don't they? but there's nothing like having them when they're in season. And I mean, and this is something that we can all do in order to, to help reduce our ecological footprint, mm, mm. is eating local food, yeah. locally mm. produced seasonal things. And I think in Germany, you're much more aware. I mean, I was in, a, in the UK uh, a few months ago and in a farm shop and it was sort of January or something, and there was a little girl in there with her mother saying they wanted to buy apples. And the, 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 the woman in the farm shop turned around and said, I can't believe that they've been asking the children to make apple pies at school, you know, in January. And you wouldn't yeah. have that in Germany. 
You know, everybody knows that apples well, ripen. Although you can get apples all through you the... Can, you can. You can. I mean, there's you know. a There's a celebration, though, a seasonal no, celebration right. in mm. apple period. Yeah. You know, they're ripening now. And yeah. we'll have something in our local school where everybody will bring in varieties. Mm. Um, and it's and the aspar and asparagus season yeah, is especially strong here. I mean, yeah. th this, I'm talking, we're talking about white asparagus yeah, yeah. again which I come from the same country as you. I didn't know white asparagus. I always thought asparagus was small and green. Yeah. But there's these big white asparagus, which is totally delicious, yes. They are totally delicious. I'm a convertee, definitely. Yeah, OK. Anyway, let's have a look at your life here in Germany. The other day, Sarah showed us round her Berlin. here outside the Natural History Museum in Berlin. Nature is all around us outside, but this is the house of nature here. This is where we can learn more about our natural world. This is Brachiosaurus, and in fact, this is the largest fossilized specimen in the world. Most museums show copies of the fossil, but this is actually the real thing. What you see in here is the biodiversity from the Jurassic era, which is 150 million years ago. You can see life in the oceans, life on land, and life in the sky. This is Archaeopteryx. This is definitely one of my favorite specimens in the whole museum. This clearly shows the link between dinosaurs and birds. It has dinosaur features, and feathers of birds. We're in the spirit collection where all these animals are preserved in alcohol. So this is the biodiversity wall and this is the most fantastic example of the biodiversity on our planet. We have the birds and we have the insects, we have mammals, and the fish, and the reptiles. And it, I think it's absolutely stunning the way it's been displayed here. This is Charles Darwin's sketch um, that he made. Um, and the idea here is, is that all animals and plants have a common origin. And this was an incredibly important philosophical point for humans to start to think about their place in nature being part of nature rather than above nature. I can see the red squirrel in nature all around Berlin and I'll never get bored of that. And once I've seen it in nature, I can then come to the Naturkunde and I can see it and learn more about it. You don't need to go to a tropical rainforest to find biodiversity. It's all around us, even in these urban environments. We can learn so much from the way children react to nature. They're so inquisitive and so excited. The finding of the first year's conquer is a real excitement for the children. Humans finding a new relationship with nature, I feel, is an important part of finding a sustainable future. And I did want to ask you, um, uh, I've got here, Berlin is Europe's greenest capital. You obviously like Berlin, but would you actually, a lot of people, the trend is to move out to the country from here. Would you rather be in the city? Yeah, I, there's no need to move out. We've got loads of lakes and forests and, you know, everyone's just surrounded by nature in a way. I, that, I think it's a unique city in that way. Mm, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would. I really like the centre of Berlin. And I know now you're more involved in not in botany, if you like, in rituals. Do tell us what's the, this is your latest project? Yes. Or? Well, I'm. It's it's not a not that far removed from my botany. I'm I'm interested in way finding ways to try and encourage all all people to live slightly more ecologically friendly lives. Uh -huh. So, and rituals have been used throughout history, um, for example, with uh, religion, uh, you know, church bells ring um, at eight o'clock in my, where I live in, in Berlin, eight o'clock in the morning, midday, 
and six o'clock in the evening. And these are to remind me in a very subtle way of my religious obligations um, and, you know, not to sin and all the rest of the things. Um, and one goes to church if you're religious, you might go to church once a week. And this is reminding us what our, what our responsibilities are to God and to our neighbours and all the rest of it. Um, and so I think in a way I'm, I'm researching as to whether one could use rituals in a similar way to remind us perhaps, I mean, for example, uh, my family, we've just started uh, Meat Free Monday, which is uh, once a week, we have no meat. Um, and this is this type of thing, one can turn into a, into a, a sort of ritual uh, to remind us what it's what uh, of our responsibility is there a book in this then well i maybe or, maybe a program oh. maybe a series i don't yeah. know we'll have to uh, see watch this space okay. we'll watch this we'll space see yeah now before we go we've only got a couple of minutes left we i want to ask you about um a, a few things you you wrote in our questionnaire uh, the first one being your favorite german word do you remember what oh, you wrote? yes quatsch Quatsch. Oh, How do we explain that now to an international <laughs> audience? It's kind of nonsense. Or... Nonsense, but not rude. No. You know, if if somebody said something to you and you turn around and said rubbish, you know, people might take offence. But actually, quatsch, yes. it's, it's, it's playful. Not so rude. It's, it's quite playful, it's, isn't it? Yeah. And quatschen, which is the verb, is actually chatting. To, right. To chat. Well, I didn't know that. Oh, well, well there you go. Yeah, thank there you. you. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the best thing about living in Germany, you said trains, street parties, outdoor life in general, yeah. and um, shops closed on oh, Sundays. Wonderful. I'm not We've... quite used to it yet, but, mm -hmm. but you know, I think it's wonderful because it stops... I, I really see in, in the UK that shopping on a Sunday becomes a pastime. You know, families disappear off to chains, you know, I and hate to write, you won't know this, but a huge amount of my guests have said this. Really? Yeah. Right. It's a really... Yeah. A, people who come from uh, countries where it's shops 24-7. 24-7. They yeah. really love it, on the whole. I mean, not all. Some people wish there were shops open on Sunday, but most of them do. And um, uh, something the Germans do poorly, you put dressing. Everybody wears grey or black. And what's the book you're going to write? Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> yeah, about <laughs> Berlin life. But, I mean, I notice in the summer there's loads of colour. It's yeah. as soon as the autumn comes, the, the shades of grey. OK, OK. And something the Germans do extremely well, of course, public transport. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. Isn't it efficient? It is indeed. Yeah, it it is. is indeed. And the worst thing about living in Germany, do you remember what you said? Ooh, punctuality, was it? No. No. no the, worst the worst thing, thing about, about living... living... Oh, yes. What was that? Yeah, actually, it wasn't me that said that. It was my husband. No. <laughs> Too many Brits. Really? In that case, I'm leaving the studio <laughs> now and I'll let you get on... No. no. <laughs> Too many Brits. Too many... Uh, they... Oh, I see. But he you're... put that in and I never managed to delete it. <laughs> oh, OK. Sarah, Sarah Darwin, it's been fabulous talking to you. Um, thank you for giving us these wonderful prints of your illustrations for us to give away. Write to us at insight at dw.de if you're interested to win one. I'm afraid people write in and say, can I have one? And where's my print? And things like that. Well, it is, a, you know, there's lots of people who write in, only one winner, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for joining Thank us. Thank you, Robin. Have a good, uh, enjoy your life in Germany, as I'm sure you are. Um, thank you for watching and uh, do join us again at the same time next week. Bye-bye for now.